Krishna Narayanan. I'm from IIT Madras. And our first speaker today is Professor Brijesh Kumar from JNU. So I will not waste too much of our time. I invite Professor Brijesh Kumar. Thank you, Rajesh. And good morning, friends. <coughs> it's a pleasure to come to my home institution. And thank you, Kedar and uh, Subhuto, for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my work. OK. So uh, this is about uh, a rather uh, beautiful and uh, historic problem called Shasti Sutherland model and a related material, which is uh, strontium copper borate. And uh, the problem that we are going to discuss is the magnetization behavior in these uh, model problems as well as the real material. Uh, <clears throat> a very quick uh, sort of uh, summary of what I have tried to, or what I will try to present in this talk. Uh, this is the material which uh, generated a lot of excitement because it was a two-dimensional quantum spin liquid, if you wish, or a dimerized singlet uh, compound, a spin gap compound, one of the first kind, I, uh, one of the first, I guess. And it turned out uh, it happens to be an exact realization of the Shasti Sutherland model, which was also uh, a first of its kind, exactly soluble ground state, uh, singlet, uh, quantum paramagnetic state, basically. Now, <clears throat> there is another very beautiful model, uh, which was actually uh, proposed uh, before any of these things, a quantumizing model, which is basically an Ising problem, up, down, I mean, uh, spins which could be up or down, interacting via classical Ising interaction. And then you turn on a small quantum fluctuation, which is through the transverse field, for instance. And what we realized, this is over last one year or so, that actually, uh, this problem, uh, in the presence of magnetic field, which is what people are interested in, uh, have been interested in for last uh, almost 15 years, to understand the magnetization behavior of this compound. The most exciting thing about this has been, apart from the fact that it is a realization of this model, that it exhibits, and this is, I think, the first, uh, again, instance of a material which exhibits uh, magnetization plateaus. So, uh, and there is no clear understanding as yet. So it's an open problem at uh, various levels. So what we realize that actually this problem of magnetization behavior in this compound can actually be understood through something called quantumizing problem. In fact, the effective model that we derive happens to be a quantumizing-like problem. <coughs> so this is, for instance, uh, the, I mean, just the, figures from the papers, original papers, where they, of course, these are just little shoulders here and there, but later on, more clear figures of plateaus emerged. So it's very clear, and these are all reproducible. People in 2014 also find this. So it's a very consistent data. People have gone on to very high fields, tried to reach plateau half, and so on. But the take home message is from the experimental side that there are plateaus, and they are very consistent. Uh, everybody finds them. And the most prominent of them are these fractions. This fraction refers to total magnetization divided by the saturation magnetization. So at fraction 1 by 8, 1 by 6, 1 by 4, 1 by 3, and 1 by 4. So these are the plateaus which people have uh, confidently observed. There are more recent reports which seem to suggest that there are other plateaus, 2 by 15. But you can as well think of 2 by 15 as being 1 by 8 if it is 2 by 16. So you, know, you are not very sure. Uh, to what degree these resolutions are. Uh, but I believe they are uh, there, and there is a lot of interest in finding if there are more structures underneath and so on. Now, our contribution to this uh, story uh, came recently. And uh, uh, what we believe is that we have made, I think, an important breakthrough in terms of understanding this problem, that what is the origin of magnetization plateaus. Uh, it's not that this, pro I mean, this problem has been studied by has been studied uh, very uh, systematically for all these years. But uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the nicest thing about our approach is its simplicity and straightforwardness, and the unambiguity with which it gives the plateaus. And I'll tell you uh, what is all that. OK. Fine, so let us very quickly uh, for the for those who may not know about this compound, this is a two-dimensional system. Uh, well, quasi-two-dimensional, so there is, it's all 3D in real world. But 
there are layers of copper borates, which is uh, what we have to focus on. Uh, borate just acts like an inert ligand. Copper is uh, copper 2 plus, uh, you can see here, yeah, copper is copper 2 plus. So, this is what is contributing to uh, the magnetic uh, the spins, the magnetic movements in the system. And uh, people find that this is a skin gap, spin gap system. I mean, these are experimental papers. So, this was the example of first quantum paramagnet uh, in dimerized sense. I mean, that will become clear a little later. And this is a Mott insulator. Uh, for the same reason as Q plates are Mott insulators. So, this is a basically insulating spin half quantum problem. And, and we all know that if, for, if we were to write a basic uh, model for such a Mott insulating system, we just follow Anderson's prescription, uh, which is that uh, for a Mott insulator uh, with effective one band per side, the neighboring spins exchange through T squared by U kind of uh, antiferromagnetic exchange interaction. And uh, this leads to a very simple, so you can ignore rest of it. I mean, the exchange is, of course, happening through the borate ligand here. So these, these guys are the borates. The black circles are copper. So at the level of uh, modeling this problem, you just ignore everything else. You just keep the, remember the fact that there is an effective interaction between the spins sitting at the copper sites, and that's it. So this is the basic. Uh, lattice uh, magnetic or spin lattice problem. Uh, just one second, I'm free. yeah. So this is the basic uh, physical model that one can write down for uh, strontium copper borate, which is the strong exchange interaction, well, strong or weak, uh, the experiment decide, but it turns out that this, these red bonds are the stronger interaction. So the strong bonds, the copper dimers have some exchange, and then there is a inter-dimer interaction, which is denoted as J prime. And this was, uh, of course, worked out by Miara and Ueda without realizing that this model actually exists in the literature. And somebody told them that this is nothing but Shasti Sutherland model. So that is how uh, uh, it was realized that this problem is nothing more than the Shasti Sutherland model. Except that it looks, when Shastri and Sutherland did it, they drew it differently. They wrote down a square lattice, then generated some selective diagonal interaction. So generally, if you have a J1, J2 problem, you have all kinds of cross bonds. But here you are, uh, I mean, they are just taking some of them. And it turns out this makes the problem exactly soluble for the ground state in the absence of magnetic field. Fine. So now uh, let us come to the Shasti Sutherland model. Uh, the Shasti Sutherland model, as we have already stated, uh, is, uh, is a model with uh, dimers arranged orthogonally and interacting with each other with some coupling J prime and intra dimer coupling is J, of course. Uh, this is a problem of frustrated quantum spin halves. I mean, one can, in principle, have higher spins also, but as far as strontium copper borate is concerned, this is a quantum spin half problem. And the frustration, because uh, I mean, this has been repeated up to time, but I'll repeat it one more time that. If you have triangles, and if the mutual, I mean, bond pairwise interaction between the spins on triangle is antiferromagnetic, then, uh, for instance, take this cartoon. If it is up, this is down, then what is this spin? And this is the neatest, simplest way you can think about frustration. And here, you have lots of triangles. So, uh, for instance, there is this triangle sharing a bond with that triangle. And so you can think about, at the level of constructing this model or this lattice, you can think about uh, Shasti Sutherland lattice as uh, an arrangement of bond sharing triangles. And, uh, and at the corner of these triangles, there are spins, and they are obviously interacting by antiferromagnetic exchange because that is what, uh, uh, <coughs> that is what it is. So, this is a frustrated quantum spin half problem. Historically, this was, this construction was, as we can see, that this model was, it predates uh, the discovery of strontium copper borate uh, by yeah, many, many years. And the original motivation for drawing this model uh, were uh, uh, drawn from Majumdar Ghosh problem, which is a landmark problem in the sense that it, for the first time, demonstrated, uh, discussed uh, a frustrated uh, uh, quantum uh, Heisenberg type problem and found out that frustration can lead to spontaneous dimerization. This is also a problem where Shastri and Sutherland showed that spin-ons can be visualized somewhat neatly as domain walls. They are not as exact as in case of Heisenberg 
antiferromagnet, but they are qualitatively there. Okay. So, so right. So, strontium copper borate with a with Shasti Sutherland model is a frustrated problem with the dimerized pattern. And what else, else we know about it? Well, this is an exactly soluble problem uh, whose ground state uh, happens to be a direct product of singlets. So, let me just draw this cartoon. So, these red bonds here, or dumbbell shaped uh, bonds, whatever, so they are spins uh, which form singlet. So, this is the lattice or the model, and this is the ground state of this model. What it is trying to tell you is that these stronger bonds just form singlets, and that's it. And you form singlet on all such strong bonds, and that's the ground state. And uh, this obviously, therefore, has no magnetic moment. Uh, the ground state is just perfect singlet, and there is no order. And uh, you can also feel that uh, to break any of this bond, it would cost some energy. Therefore, it is also a spin-gapped uh, system. So all of the properties of strontium copper borate immediately get explained by this uh, model, because it is indeed the model of the problem. In fact, uh, some people told me, some people who have been working in this field for many years, that the, the phrase spin liquid, people believe, was first time coined in this paper of Shasti and Sutherland. Even though the valence bond physics was known from RBB times, from Anderson and Fajikas and so on, but the term spin liquid to describe that, you know, there is no order in this, you know, there is no non zero expectation of spin operator uh, was also coined in this paper. Obviously, it exhibits quantum phase transition because there are competing interactions and you can tune them. So, for academic interest, we, it's important to know what is the nature of quantum phase transition. It's not 100% settled, but uh, more or less the, this is the figure uh, which says that the dimer phase, the exact dimer singlet phase, uh, if you increase J prime, for instance, uh, keeping J equal to 1, then the dimer phase uh, extends up to 0.68. Uh, this is all exact. I mean, the, the numerical value of this point is not exact, but the ground state is exact. Uh, uh, then, of course, if you are approaching from the J prime side, it is all nail order because this is suppose J was zero, then it is just a square lattice problem, and you have a nail order, and there is a transition from nail order to another state, from dimer state to another state, and that intermediate state is the debatable part of this phase diagram, and people believe that uh, it is some sort of placket phase where these square plackets form singlets. That is the picture which has emerged, and it has been further corroborated by Corbos and Miller more recently using uh, uh, numerical methods such as IPAPs and so on. Uh, okay, <clears throat> and another very interesting feature which is relevant to our discussion, and we will see a little later why, is that uh, the triplet excitations. So, singlet ground state is singlet. But suppose if you create triplet by any means, and magnetic field is one way in which you can create such triplets, or by doing anything else. So it's important to know what is the nature of such excitations on top of this singlet ground state. And it turns out that the triplet excitations uh, with respect to such a dimerized ground state happens to, on Shasti Sutherland model uh, lattice, happen to be very highly localized. Gap part is obvious that you need to break a bond and pay some energy, which is roughly proportional to J and some corrections from J prime, but uh, what was not obvious is that why they would be so highly localized. Generally, you create a triplet and they disperse and they form triplon bands and so on. And that uh, adds to the complexity of this problem when it comes to discussing the magnetization behavior of the system. Fine. So, in the presence of magnetic field, which is the problem of problem of interest to us, uh, uh, what do we do? Uh, all of so, the exact state is, of course, for h equal to 0, but when you have a non zero h and you vary h, you increase it, what kind of states it go through, what, what is the nature of this problem uh, is not very clear. Uh, it's becoming clear, I mean, but it's not settled. Okay. So, uh, this problem of magnetization behavior of Shasti Sutherland and model or strontium copper borate has been studied. Uh, uh, in two different ways so far. Uh, the first approach has to do with deriving effective models. 
in terms of uh, these triplet excitations on dimers. So by dimer triplet, I mean in this, uh, the triplet made out of these two spins on the strong bond. Uh, the basic idea uh, for such uh, effective models is basically summarized in this cartoon. So imagine an isolated dimer, then it has a singlet, which is red line, and three triplets at h equal to zero. But at any finite field, uh, the triplet splits, and one of the triplet crosses with singlet, and that is the process by which magnetization is generated in the system. So the idea is that at the level of, I mean, we can't study uh, the full problem, it's difficult, but at least we can simplify it or at least generate an effective uh, problem out of it by focusing only on these two states because it is this crossing which generates the magnetization in the system. So you ignore these two triplets for the purpose of discussing this problem at any finite field and just focus on these two, uh, the, the singlet and the lowest triplet which cross eventually and generate magnetization. And so you can basically think about an effective hardcore boson problem. This is what people have done systematically. Then the other approach, not so, I would say, <laughs> uh, popular, in, at least in this context, is the churn simons mean field theory, which was pioneered by Mishkis and uh, Steve Gavin and so on, and revisited by a number of people, Cristiano Batista, Sebastian did experiments. Uh, and try to fit with the theory. The basic idea of Chan Simons mean field theory is that uh, you rewrite spin half as the fermions. So it's like Jordan Wigner type problem, but in two dimension. And we all know in two dimension it's not neat like in one dimension. And uh, it gives you things, but uh, for instance, this, this is the number they predicted that within this theory you will find plateaus at all such fractions, one by q, where q is greater than two, uh, and a special one at two by five. But it's a very uncontrolled sort of uh, approach in the sense that you know, going from spin to fermion in 2D is a very, very non-local task. I mean, it's, it's always non-local task, but in 1D at least, eventual model is simple. If you think about 1D XY problem, for instance, where it was done or used most effectively for the first time, but in 2D, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not obvious, I mean, if it works and um, how reliable are these uh, numbers. That's right. No, they do, I mean, in the sense that they can have uh, these uh, densities of ends. Ends could be, so I'm saying they could choose a bigger unit cell, allow n to be local. n is the number of fermion at a site, for instance. So ni's could be local variables, in principle. No, I, I haven't. Uh, no, I think they also, I mean, uh, these fractions they get only uh, when they crystallize something, but those, I mean, so in so, what I'm saying is they, they use a bigger unit cell, and there is a fermion number which is local variable. It's not some, huh? Yes, of some sort, I think. But uh, they get uh, plateaus which are, I mean, uh, which, okay, some fractions match with the numbers that we know, but some fractions are never seen, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't very direct in a way. That's right. So a majority of people have followed this approach because this is very direct. And uh, you get to talk about magnetization directly in terms of spins and not in terms of some effective uh, variables and so on. I think the motivations for this were to somehow relate it to Hall effect, uh, as we know, quantize Hall effect rather than uh, I mean, I, I don't know. My, I'm somehow reserved, but I may not be the best person to articulate that reservation. I don't feel very comfortable with this. Uh, whereas this approach is direct and more physical. There is no room for confusions or errors in interpreting the results and calculation. But 
uh, so let me focus on uh, the effective dimer models. I mean, sorry, effective models in terms of these um, uh, hardcore uh, bosons per dimer. Now, so you you so just go back to the last slide. Now we are just focusing on these two states. So we are ignoring V. So per dimer we have just a singlet and a triplet. And uh, it's important to know that what is the property or behavior of this triplet state in order to know what the magnetization process will be eventually, what kind of magnetization behavior you expect. Now people uh, uh, did simple and systematic calculations and figured out two very nice things about the hardcore boson on this lattice, this effective hardcore boson. One is that the triplet, this triplet which is induced by field, magnetic field, doesn't disperse easily. So you can see the hopping, the, the triplet starting from here and going to, let us say, this site. Uh, this is the simplest uh, hopping process which one could figure out. And this is up to sixth order in J prime by J. So it's a very weak pro And J prime by J is 0.6 or 6.3, 6 I think, in the, 6.3 in the system, yeah. So it's a very weak process. Uh, and hence, uh, the statement which I made earlier that the triplets are highly localized objects on the system. So the presence of J prime, the interdimer coupling, does not help in uh, dispersing the triplet easily. And this happens due to the geometry. I mean, uh, yeah, it's like saying, you see, this is an important point to note that the fact that there is orthogonal dimer geometry, this triplet, uh, uh, this singlet wouldn't do anything to this. So this remains wherever it is. This singlet, in principle, can come here, but it can't come here either because at a bond level, it's the total spin operator which acts. So you can see, for instance, when T1 wants to go here, it, it's not the singlet which comes here. It, it's a T0 which comes here because it, can, it has to remain in the triplet sector. So it's a, I mean, I'm saying the orthogonal geometry makes the problem complex and restricts the motion of uh, uh, the triplet excitation. If it were simple two dimers, and and with the connection, then this singlet would go here, triplet would come here. But here it doesn't happen neatly. And that is the reason why it's very. So in, in a way, the orthogonal singlet arrangement around it uh, shields its motion uh, very effectively. If it were not an orthogonal arrangement, then it would not shield. It would, the the dis dispersion of triplet would be very direct and simple. The other thing people figured out uh, is that even though triplet uh, direct triplet hopping is very weak, but two triplets nearby can <laughs> make uh, hoppings more easy. So for instance, if there is a triplet here and there is another triplet here, then this triplet can easily jump from here to there, which means this bond. So the dark ones are the triplets, the lighter ones are singlet or whatever. Maybe this is not very clear, but this is a triplet we are at. So this bond has a triplet, this bond has a triplet, and then it jumps to there. So the presence of another triplet nearby assists the triplet to hop. So there is a correlated hopping process, some sort of interaction, two-body term, which is actually more dominant, uh, much more dominant than uh, the direct hopping of the triplet. OK. So in summary, these uh, models have Uh, so this uh, dimer hardcore boson approach has basically two uh, points. One is that the kinetic energy is very weak of these hardcore bosons, dimer hardcore particles, uh, and the interaction dominates as a result of which. And so the effective model is basically repulsion plus a little bit of correlated hopping, if you like, which itself is an interaction of some sort. And this leads to magnetization plateaus. Uh, uh, as a result of crystallization of, because the no interaction dominates, the triplets, which are highly localized uh, to satisfy the interaction, tend to form various crystalline states, and these are the plateau states. Yes? Uh, yes, in, it does suggest that, and there is a very recent work which seems to therefore go beyond just simple crystallization of triplets to the crystallization of bound states. I'll only mention it, but not discuss it in detail. But yes, it does suggest that. That's right. 
And it can also depend on what is the strength of J prime. The, so. And uh, <coughs> from the early days till not so recent, but recent times, people have gone on to generate these effective models up to, you can see, 15th power of J prime by J, 15,000 processes, all numerically done, but done with a lot of commitment and, and clarity. But the difficulty is that uh, there are 15,000 terms, and you don't know which term is giving 1 by 8 and which term is not giving 1 by 8. And uh, I mean, it's just too complex. Uh, it gives plateaus, but with a little bit of tweaking here and there, you can get any plateau you like, or at least a lot of plateaus if you like to. I mean, that is my impression. Uh, yeah. So despite the sophistication and a lot of effort, uh, the ambiguity about the occurrence of plateaus remains in the sense that which plateau occurs and why. Is there a very direct and neat way of seeing that is not very clear. So the approach is systematic. There is nothing wrong with the way it is built, but uh, yeah, but it doesn't still seem to give the most satisfactory answers as far as the magnetization processes are concerned, and the plateaus are concerned. So let me now, in the final bit of my talk, describe our approach quickly. So how we, uh, uh, what we did. So I mean. One thing we realized uh, by listening to others for all these years and reading their papers that dimer triplets approach is never going to give neat description, even if you go from 15,000 terms to one more term extra. And there is a lot of ambiguity in terms of what you generate as it is uh, from that effective problem. I mean, one people sometimes said, okay, it's not one by eight plateau, but one by nine. And then experiment insisted, no, it has to be 1 by 8. So they again went back and said, OK, the same model gives 1 by 8. So I'm saying that kind of ambiguity persists. You have a very complex effective problem, uh, which is done very sincerely. But uh, it seems to miss uh, that clarity and the uh, confidence with which to say that, OK, these are the only plateaus. And they occur for this and this reason, and that's it. So we thought, OK, it's important to probably go beyond it. And what could be the simplest way to go beyond it? And this is what, uh, so back to the same Hamiltonian in the magnetic field. So the first thumb rule we set up is don't work with dimer states. Then what do we work with? <laughs> now, so here I take the motivation from molecular solids. So imagine I have this organic compound forming triangular lattice. I don't worry about the states of individual atoms of that big mo organic molecule. My effective single electron state there is the molecular orbital of that molecule. And I forget the details, then I just focus on the effective triangular lattice for one electron problem. So here, in the shastri Sutherland model, the Brave lattice is not, I mean, it doesn't have one spin per site. So even crystallographically speaking, at the very simple level, uh, the minimal unit cell has uh, two dimers in it. So my point was that because these two dimers are sitting in orthogonal arrangement, and this orthogonality of arrangement is not allowing the triplet to hop around, and therefore to generate the full effect of J prime, which in principle it would like to uh, express at a theoretical level, why not work with this minimal molecular unit? rather than worry about the dimers. Even though it's easier to think in terms of dimers, they are dimers indeed. But if, it, if they were dimers just like staggered dimer, it would have been so much simpler. The triplons disperse directly. I mean, but here, somehow, the triplons are not able to express themselves if I just work within the dimer approach because of the orthogonal geometry. So we said, OK, since it's not working, and there is a reason why it seems not to be working, I just told you. Let us go to the most natural, uh, simple situation which one would instinctively like to do, which apparently no one did, to uh, write down the natural unit cells, work in the states of that cell. So this is the basic uh, idea. 
uh, one could in principle choose this unit cell in different ways. But since we are interested in strontium copper borate, which is where J is stronger, it's better to think about two stronger dimers in the unit cell. What I'm saying is all I need is four spins. I could have chosen this square as my unit cell, but then it, I'm starting from a wrong you know, starting point as far as this strontium copper borate is concerned. So I just, uh, I, I'm guided by the fact that the red dimers are stronger in strontium copper borate, so I choose that unit cell which contains two strong dimers within it, uh, including the J prime interaction. And then, uh, just like we did the exercise for a single dimer in the magnetic field, first let us understand the uh, unit cell problem in magnetic field. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, if you view it, this lattice, it would look like a triangular sort of lattice in terms of unit cells. So let us just discuss the states of this uh, unit cell. OK, it again has a singlet. It has to have, which is just the dimers forming singlet, the red line. And then it has triplets and so on. Our interest is in the magnetic field. So as a, OK, so this is important. So now we follow the same philosophy that in the presence of magnetic field, what is generating magnetization? Well, the crossing of the nearest triplet to the singlet. So for our case, the, the only difference is now these states are not the dimer states, but the states of a bigger units, I mean, of the natural unit cell of the Shasti cell and lattice. So we just choose these two states as our minimal basis to discuss the problem in the magnetic field. So the singlet of the unit cell and one of the triplets of the, the lowest one, which crosses first. So the minimal basis is, so I'm just calling this as 0 and the nearest triplet as 1. So 0 means no hardcore boson or singlet. 1 here refers to having created one triplet, but at the unit cell level. And this triplet, this one state, cat1, uh, is, uh, it includes J prime. So it, at least it partially carries the effect of J prime, the pathological coupling between the dimers, it's little bit exactly. So the, at the state level, at the level of the basic state we chose, we already have some effect of J prime built into it. And we see that uh, it immediately reflects uh, in, the, uh, in the physical results that we get. Uh, OK, fine. So now everything is simple. You just rewrite this problem in this hardcore boson basis of the unit cells. So the simplest term is, of course, magnetic field, which is chemical potential. And the interesting terms, which uh, would never arise if you just work with, at the simplest minimal level, I mean, you have to work extra hard, generate all kinds of terms up to sixth order or so, is the direct Ising-like, in, I mean, Ising interaction or density-density interaction between these. So n here, just uh, let me see, I have, uh, I have something, yeah, just for your, ah, it's slow for some reason, maybe, if you, yeah, so n just means the number of triplets per side. So it's a hardcore boson. n is 0 or 1. If there is a triplet, it's 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So v and v prime are the important interactions that naturally and minimally emerge as a result of this very simple exercise going beyond the dimer approach. So, so this is the very minimal model. Diagonal means, uh, oh, you mean, uh -huh, yes. Yeah, that's also interesting, no? So you have a quantum mechanical problem to begin with, but the minimal effective problem is a purely classical problem. And it has to do with the fact that triplons or triplet excitations are not able to move around. It's, the, it's in the, built into the nature of orthogonal geometry of the problem. Right. Off diagonal means hopping is natural, but hopping is not natural here. That is the problem. So to generate hopping or anything of that kind, you have to go extra hard. I mean, you have to go beyond it. So that is what we are trying to do now. But I'm saying this is the very minimal that you get immediately. That's right. But I'm saying if you keep just that, it wouldn't give you 1 by 8 or 1 by 6 or 1 by 3. This will give. Suppose if I had just kept. 
yeah it in fact it is uh, it has contributions of j prime by j up to infinite order at least partially okay. so it have all the no 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 it doesn't but it has some contributions already built into it so we can do some simple exercise such as take write down the effective model in terms of correlate to hopping this is what people have done but and just keep it at the minimal level suppose you won't get uh, 1 by 6 plateaus No, no. Uh, no, no. It, it may be correct theory, but it doesn't get the right answer. Then uh, I mean, I don't know. No, fine. Okay, you can write down an effective model in terms of Daimler hardcore bosons up to correlated hopping level. Fine, it's correct. Nothing is wrong with that, but it doesn't give us the answer or the physical answer. I mean, I'm not doubting those uh, complex theories. Yeah. Reading order in? No, this is what I'm saying. We. I'm not resumming anything. Yeah, I. I've, so it will be. Uh, yeah, I have to figure out those expressions, but I mean, I just don't often remember. But numerically, for instance, j prime by j is 0.63. And uh, if I am sitting at 0.63, which is somewhere here, you can see V is uh, about same order, uh, or uh, little less. In fact, it is exponential scale. So it is, let us say, 1 by 10 of that. And V double prime, is, sorry, V prime is about uh, V prime is red line. So V prime is about 1 hundredth of that. So you can say it's of the order of j prime by j square, the leading term, if you wish, uh, v. OK. No, but I'm saying, uh, so I mean, I, OK, let me write down. If you want to see the expression. Uh, I think it would be j, okay. It would be j prime times something. So this is the number. I think it's j prime. So I'm I'm sorry. I don't remember the expression. There is an ex exact expression for this. Uh, yeah, I'll show you that. So so v would be okay. So v is j prime times a number. That's the correct answer. And that so that number is uh, I don't remember. So you can see that v okay good. So let me just re-answer your question again. So V and V primes are directly proportional to J prime. That's the answer. Okay. And hence it is roughly in the same scale. Good. So now if I just stick to this very minimal problem and ask what kinds of plateaus would I get? And so this is the phase diagram in the J prime by J space and H by J. Uh, we basically get, if I had the very minimal model without the, so these terms, these two terms I have written a bit more heuristically uh, in the sense that I have argued it's there, but I have not derived them systematically. That is what I'm saying. So at the very minimal level, which is V and V prime, uh, we will get three pl uh, plateaus unambiguously, which is 1 by 6, 1 by 4, and 1 by 3. And that was never uh, achievable within the dimer hardcore boson approach. This is unambiguous. And then if you think a bit more carefully and you introduce this V double prime. So V is this, V prime is this, and V double primes are interactions, uh, for instance, between this and this side, and V triple prime is this side. So this is an isotropic Ising problem. The moment you introduce a V double prime, no matter how small, and this is uh, the heuristic uh, estimate that we have, this is this line, dotted line here, tells you that this is even smaller than V prime. This is a very tiny uh, term, uh, which is also, in, uh, cons I mean, in fact, this figure is, in effective sense, consistent with the interactions which uh, people have calculated for the trip, you know, triplets of different ranges from this triplet to that triplet and so I mean 
the other people I have mentioned who derived effective models up to 15,000 terms. So this overall behavior of the interaction that I have generated is in the same uh, numerical scale. So the moment we turn on a small v prime, v double prime, we actually stabilize 1 8 and 3 8 also. So the, uh, and in fact, <coughs> there is a very neat and clear particle hole symmetry which relates different plateaus. So, in, so there is a underlying structure that if there is a 1 8, 1 6 plateau, there must be a 1 3rd plateau. It is not by chance that there is a 1 6 and 1 3rd. 1 4th is in some sense the central plateau. If there is 1 8 plateau, at least within this description that we have developed, there should be a 3 8 plateau too, which has not been seen. So one can wonder what could be the, so I'm just doing things at a minimal level. My objective is to understand this physical problem at a minimal level without much of confusions and ambiguities. So this is a, a neat piece of information that we have, that these plateaus are also related through an underlying particle hole symmetry. But 3 8 has not been seen yet. Either it will be seen or it will never be seen. What will be the situation, I don't know. But there is another little interesting point to the story. And these are, of course, patterns of uh, unit cell triplets and so on. So I don't show this. Now, coming to the, uh, so, th so far the discussion for Shasti cell and model alone. Now, as far as the strontium copper borate is concerned, people have uh, experimentally seen that there is tiny bit of DM interaction, which is about one uh, tenth of, uh, uh, yeah, one tenth of, uh, uh, or one hundredth of J. J is about 100K, and these are only few Kelvins. So there is a zialisinski moria type interaction uh, in this problem. A tiny amount, as far as it compared to the J and J prime, the dominant couplings. But you can see that V and V primes are also 1 by 10 or 1 by 100th of j. So even though dm interaction is much weak compared to j and j prime, it is not weak compared to the actual interactions which are driving this plateau behavior. So if we include that, again, at a very minimal level, which means take this term, as people have told us, how it arises in this strontium copper borate problem, and just rewrite this these terms in terms of the uh, unit cell hardcore bosons that we are working with. And what we generate is a very transverse feed-like interaction. I'm calling it transverse feed-like because these Ds, the coefficients sitting here, themselves depend on the occupancies Ni's, the hardcore boson occupancy surrounding a given site. And hence the term inhomogeneous dynamic because the inhomogeneity is not given from outside, but it is generated by the dynamics itself. So, so these coefficients are classical numbers. They depend, but they depend on the Ni's. Uh, so for instance, this coefficient depend on what is the number of hardcore boson at the neighbor delta 2 or delta 3. And similarly, this depends on all 3. So these are expressions written in the paper. I, I don't need to write that. So the minimal model, therefore, if we have to think about the physical strontium copper bird problem is, the Ising problem, or the uh, direct, I mean, simple density-density interaction of hardcore bosons, plus a small amount of transverse field due to the DM interaction. And interestingly, the moment we have this, we include this uh, weak but physical effect, which is present in the system, that neat particle hole symmetry is broken. So you can, for instance, so this is actually uh, data from, just we took a, we did a, so we took this model, the minimal model, and put in all the physical parameters that we have, uh, we have the information about, V, V prime, Ds, et cetera, and do a ED calculation on a 12-site cluster. Just a very simple, minimal calculation, nothing very, and 12-site because it will, in principle, have all possibilities. So if I were to use just four sites, well, something like that, then it will not stabilize one third plateaus, fractions with one three. So just I take, min and anyway, beyond it, we can't go with our resources or abilities to do ED. So 12 side with no conservation laws is a big problem, but we did it. Uh, my student did it, in fact. 
And the important point here is this. Uh, the transverse fluctuations, the DM interaction does smoothen out the plateaus, but it doesn't, uh, so depending on the strength, it can scale or not scale, so there is 1 by 8 still. But important point is that there is a asymmetry below and above 1 by 4, which is also an experimental fact. So as I said, that according to the minimal shasti silent effective problem, if there is 1 by 8 plateau, there must be a 3 by 8 plateau, at least at the minimal level. If we go beyond it, maybe there are some corrections even intrinsically within shasti silent problem. But the presence of DM interaction immediately suppresses or enhances the 3 by 8 plateau depending upon the sign of D. So it depends on the sign, which sign of D it is. So there is a uh, particle hole symmetry transformation which governs certain rules, which gives certain rules. So D, it depends on the sign of D. If D were of one sign, it suppresses. If it is of other sign, it enhances. So the point is, this minimal theory uh, uh, explains a lot of features about the actual physical. I mean, it doesn't, of course, quantitatively say that why this plateau is bigger. I mean, because in actual data, uh, the 1 fourth plateau is not as big as this. That is true. But at least qualitatively, it gets all the plateaus unambiguously, and it explains why there is asymmetry between below 1 by 4 and above 1 by 4. It also tells that there is an underlying particle hole relation which dictates if there is 1 by 6, then there must be 1 by 3 and 1 by 8, then 1 by 3 by 8 and so on. And it tells that the presence of DM interaction can spoil that symmetry and suppress uh, some plateaus above 1 by 4. And one more uh, thing it does is, yeah, I think that's, uh, I'll not speak about that. So this is basically uh, what we have done. Thank you very much for your patience. Rajesh, uh, I have a sort of naive question. Uh, in one of the initial slides you presented, uh, you said that the Shastri Sutherland model goes from a dimer singlet to a state which you don't quite know what it is at around 0.68. Yeah, something like that. Huh. I mean, people uh, believe, the different people have different beliefs, but one dominant set of belief is that it's a placket phase. Uh, right. Uh, now, you're trying to describe a system which is at 0.63. And uh, so point six three is, is not well known that it is very close to. Uh, uh -huh. And that phase that we don't know what it is is also pretty close to the nail phase on the other uh, direction. Yeah, yeah, it's just a tiny little phase. Yeah. Yes. So, but the underlying basis that you're using to describe the system is a basis that is inspired from the uh, strong J limit. Given that the difference between point six three and point six eight is so small, how are you convinced that the other states that you're neglecting in your uh, Basis don't contribute to the physics of the problem. Uh, you understand? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess. When you're putting in a magnetic field, you're trying to talk about a dilution scheme or interaction, which is uh, two orders of magnitude um, smaller than your couplings. I mean, the fact that you've neglected these other states in the basis, uh, don't you think it will be? Uh, it'll have a bearing on the problem. If you were, if you wanted to extract effects of interactions which are uh, much smaller than your uh, JJ prime? When how best to answer it, I don't know. Uh, is my question clear to you? Yeah, you are just worried that since you are so close to the transition point, yeah. uh, wouldn't the higher energy states uh, contribute? Yeah. But, yeah. That's a possibility. Besides, as is it far obvious as, I mean, that it's I a first order transition? Or? The from Shasti Sutherland phase to the uh, placket phase, the intermediate phase. Yeah, so there is no issue of mm, critical fluctuations disturbing the. Uh, no, but uh, see, as far as I'll probably answer more clearly the second part of the question. So the smallness of DM interaction is only small with respect to JJ prime. But I'm saying, even if, let us say, crudely, but whatever effective parameters we have generated, which are the ones which eventually, even if 
as I said crudely, they give some physical picture of the plateaus that we get. Those numbers are not very different. You see my point? So you are right that since j, uh, j prime by j is close, but I think as long as it is in the singlet phase and energetically, uh, how do I say? Um, no, no, but it doesn't mean that I am, uh, uh, so I, I, yeah, I think as far as magnetic field is concerned, um, I mean, in the first place, we choose this, this two level basis um, because they are the, I mean, they are the ones which cross. So even though there are states higher up, we just say that we ignore them. They may have some effect eventually, but I'm saying at the simplest minimal level, this is what we can do. Um, so I didn't quite understand the structure of the, the <coughs> DM interaction. Does it uh, does it commute with total SZ? Does no, no, no. It, it doesn't commute it with. Doesn't. So actually, it doesn't. The number of uh, this total n, the number of triplets is not conserved. By the no, but that is what it is. That is why it gives tau x tau y. Yeah. Because so see, then n's, n's would have been if there was just classical problem, n would be a conserved number. Right, right. But these tau's. That is why they generate, uh, I mean. So you wouldn't really expect a perfect plateau anymore once you have this interaction, uh, right? Because it's not <laughs> a, the <laughs> that's because no, the num no. number of these bosons is not that con is conserved. true, but uh, I don't know. I mean, um, in principle, one can still have, no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, unless one does a systematic need calculation on a bigger system, I, I can't say no or yes, but I'm saying, this plateau-like feature at least doesn't disappear with the presence of realistic uh, DM interaction. So there is that. In fact, for instance, just, just to answer your question, for instance, 1 by 4 plateau, uh, the 1 by 4 plateau, for instance, in the presence of DM interaction, it still looks like a plateau. I mean, by every uh, angle you see it. Whereas 1 by 8 and 1 by 6 seem to look like, you know, smoothening out much more. So depending upon, uh, yeah. So I don't think that the fact there is a little tau x and tau y, it will completely kill a plateau. Are there any further questions? If not, let's thank the speaker for a nice talk. Thank you.